Hello everyone, welcome to chapter two, the need for security. In chapter one, we introduced information security and also discussed information security approach, methodologies, as well as how information security relates to information systems and software development. Today we are going to go over how, we are going to go over why organizations need information security. By the end of this chapter, you should have an understanding of pretty much everything we are going to cover, as well as understand why organizations need to implement information security and integrate uh, and include it as part of the organization's functional responsibilities. Um, we are also going to cover the different types of organizational threats and possible attacks that exist as it relates to information security. We will also cover the common errors and mistakes that happens during software and system development. So the primary mission of pretty much information security program is to ensure information assets as well as systems are secured and safe. Now, threat is a constant thing. One cannot eliminate any threat. One cannot eliminate all threats, not any, all threats. Not an individual, no organizations can eliminate all threats. However, if no threat exists, resources could be used exclusively to improve systems that contain, use, and transmit information. So when you think of things from an organization point of view, each organization has interest in its type of information and it definitely needs to find a way to secure it. As we mentioned, organizations cannot eliminate all threats nor risk, but they can reduce, reduce it to an acceptable level. When we talk about an acceptable level is a point of risk or a point where an organization is comfortable with accepting the risk of that might arise as a result of a certain type of threat. And if this is a bit confusing, we're going to go more in depth in it uh, in this discussion, as well as when we cover the risk management chapter, we shall be able to understand entirely how risk as well as threats relate to each other. So, for every organization, their business need is always first. When you think of information security, pretty much information security performs four major important functions for an organization, which includes protecting the organization's ability to function. This has to do with when an organization's ability to function is being attacked that includes like its resources or its people or whatever it needs or depends upon to function properly that is going to impact the organization's goals and mission we um every organization also needs to protect its data as well as the information it collects and uses including um all the data that are definitely vital to making that organization succeed as well as helping the organization achieve its goals. An example would be when you think of, um, <clears throat> when you think of, trying to think of an example here, kind of a bit hard to come up. All right, let's use Coca-Cola. When you think of Coca-Cola, their recipe, that is their data, that is their information. There is a huge importance on Coca-Cola or the company to make sure that recipe is secured because that is its business. Anything happens to that recipe, maybe the information got leaked and whatsoever, it puts Coca-Cola at a disadvantage. A third important function is enabling the safe operations of applications running on the organization's IT systems. We now live in a technological era where all, or let me say most informations are being processed within 
some sort of an assistant, be it a computer, a, lot, um, a computer, a phone, uh, whatsoever. It's pretty much run on some sort of a system and applications run and process those information. So there is a need to ensure that the applications that are running on the systems, including the systems themselves, are within a uh, functioning well as well as they function in a safe environment and they function optimal and as expected. <laughs> there is also a need for organizations to safeguard the organization's technology assets. Its technology assets include the systems, the softwares, and every technology related items that enable the organization to achieve its missions and goals. When we talk about protecting systems and softwares, think of it as, as an individual protecting his or her car. When you protect your car by putting it in a garage or taking it to a mechanic for for servicing and everything you are not really the primary goal is not really to just make sure that the car runs smoothly but rather it is more you want the car to run smoothly to enable you do the functions that you need to do that requires that car so if you go to school you need definitely you need it Maybe you need a car to drive there. You need to ensure that your car is running smoothly as in secured in a safe uh, safe location because anything that happens to the car that re results in the car not functioning as required will impact your ability to go to school. So same thing with organizations. There is a huge importance on organizations to make sure that their technology assets that enable the organization's functions are secured and also work in a safe environment and work as expected. Now that we understand what organizations need are in terms of, as it relates to information security and why organizations need to secure that, we are going to look into the, some different threats and types of attacks that can be targeted towards organization that will have an impact on organization's operations as well as achieving the organization's goals and missions. Now, we are going to kind of dis uh, define some key lexicons here. A threat. A threat is a potential risk to an asset, asset's loss of value. Now, Think I will give an analogy here with um, again uh, going black down here, but uh, completely lost. All right, I will use a house to give an analogy. Think of your your house. Your house is pretty much an asset. That is your asset because that is the place you go to sleep as well as it's home. You know. And um, what type of attacks can happen to the house? That could be someone coming in to steal something or putting the house on fire or anything that pretty much will result in the destruction of that house. Now, there is a need to put controls to ensure that that attack doesn't execute, which is if, if the house, if you, have a house in a bad neighborhood, you're kind of concerned that people might come in and steal your properties, then you definitely put a door and maybe add a lock. Now, that door a lock are considered controls that stops someone from going into your house to steal your items or your properties. Now, if the door, if the lock on the door is not a really good lock that can be easily picked, that means that there is a weakness on the lock. That weakness that is on the lock and the lock being the control is what we refer to as a vulnerability. So a vulnerability is pretty much a weakness in any defensive control within a system, application, or anything. 
Now, if a thief is able to pick the lock and go into the house, it means that the thief is pretty much exploiting the weakness on the lock to go in there. Now, the ability to exploit that weakness and go in there is pretty much compromising the weakness on the lock. That is what we refer to as an exploit. So if an exploit is a technique used to compromise a system. If going back to our home analogy, it will mean an exploit will be the bill uh, picking up the lock. That picking up the lock will be the exploit because a vulnerability exists within the lock that makes it easily um, to be picked. Again, one can never eliminate risk, but one can one can only bring down risk to an acceptable level. So still referring back to our home analogy, if one lives in an if you have a house in a bad neighborhood, you might need more controls in place to make sure that you, know, um, you have reduced the threat to that house and your properties to an acceptable level. What is an acceptable level? It depends on the individual or the organizations. We have something that uh, we call risk culture and risk appetite, which we'll definitely cover in the subsequent chapters. But if you, have to put a lock because you live in a bad neighborhood. Maybe if you live even in a worse neighborhood, you might have to put some sort of a fence in or some sort of like bar, uh, metal bars in front of a door to make sure like there are additional controls before someone gets to the um, to the door and it's locked. Now, if you live in a much better neighborhood where the risk is really low and your acceptable risk is pretty much you're okay with the neighborhood, there's nothing uh, bad, you know, like no one is gonna come into your house or maybe there's even uh, police roaming around to ensure maybe some sort of a neighborhood watch is in place to make sure no one goes into people's home. You might even decide not to put a lock in front of your house and that is your acceptable risk. Same thing as it refers to technology and companies, if a small cupcake seller might not really care about their websites because chances are the website is just more of an informational website where they are just putting their address, their name and everything, but it has nothing to do with their reputation because for them to sell cupcakes and make cupcakes, they just have to go into the kitchen and bake some cupcakes and they sell it within the neighborhood. So there is really less impact on putting controls, putting defensive controls on their personal webs on their business website because maybe the website is only meant to be an informational website for the cheek of it. Now, when you think of the same thing, but with a giant or a big um, e-commerce, kind of like a web-based seller, let's take Amazon for example, there will definitely be a uh, really greater need from Amazon to put a lot of security controls in place to ensure that their website is functioning as it should function, it should accommodate all um, the users that they expect to be visiting within uh, per second, we call it concurrent connections. Um, there is also a need for Amazon to make sure no one can hack into their websites or even try to crack the web uh, passwords and all of that. So when you see it that way, you see Amazon definitely needs to put more security controls in place than the cupcake seller. That is how organizations tend to look at implementing security controls and the need for information security. Every organization aligns security with their business needs. Now that we understand what threats are and how threats relate to information security, we are going to look into categories of threats or rather the common threats that uh, that relates to pretty much organizations that 
as it relates to information security. So basically these are the different threats, uh, different types of threats and attacks that it relates to organization security. Now, this is not an exhaustive list. It is pretty much the common ones that we always tend to come across within technology. But um, technology is constantly evolving. Needs are changing. Security posture as well is always changing. The landscape is growing fast and security is always trying to catch up with technology. So as time evolves, we'll definitely see different type of threats coming up. However, these are pretty much on an umbrella viewpoint, these are pretty much the major ones. And then there are a lot of different threats within each single category of threat. And these are some of the attacks that can happen as it relates to that category of threat. So when you think of say num uh, line item number four, when we look at maybe fire, floods, earthquakes, um, lightning, all those are pretty much natural causes and it's kind of like it's considered a natural threat which is more of a process of nature and when you take a look at theft an example which is which are the attack which has to do with more like illegal confiscation of equipment and information or pretty much theft that has to do with line item number 12 theft when we look at outdated technology it has to do with line item number seven uh, number 11 look at viruses, worms, and denial of service attacks. These all has to do more with software types of attacks. And by software attacks, it means it has to do with some sort of a code or leveraging and some sort of a software or application to implement that type of um, attack. The subsequent uh, slides will have an in-depth explanation of each single category of threat. Okay, number one, we have compromise to intellectual property. Now intellectual property, it's pretty much the protection of original creation. Could be music, could be painting, could be anything. Any original idea that has been created by an individual, a company, could be a recipe for Coca-Cola again. I guess I'm due to have some Coke, it's been quite some time and I've been saying Coke, Coke, but yeah, could be recipe for Coke, could be a new drug, could be the cure for cancer. Those are all part of intellectual property and they need to be secured because those are really important to every single organization. Every organization have its own goals and mission as we mentioned. And um, for organizations that have to do with creation, of original ideas or ownership of original ideas, there has to be some sort of a way to ensure that those ideas are not replicated. And that is intellectual property. Now, there are, as it relates to technology, one of the most common intellectual breach has to do with software piracy, could be from, um, could be from downloading an illegal software and putting a crack key from a key gen, could be um, duplicating music, could be um, different form of things, could be someone writing an ebook and um, trying to duplicate it in such a way that maybe you copy it and send it to someone without them having to really pay. That is all part of um, IP as it goes. Now, a good example as, of um, IP breach as this relate to music is actually um, the early days of Napster. If you guys can remember Napster uh, was this peer-to-peer -peer sharing website that um, you can just easily go and download music and things like that and resulted into huge, um, resulted into actually a really big uh, uh, crisis between Napster and A&M Records. This was in the end, in, in the late 90s, early 2000s. And um, yeah, I believe Napster lost it, but it really kind of redefined um, 
intellectual property and the need to include technology, softwares, and um, pretty much, yeah, technology and softwares needs to be um, covered on the IP as well. Another example has to do more with like um, Apple Music, Spotify, and all of those. You can um, download songs from Spotify. You can also download songs from Apple Music to listen on your um, devices offline, but they come with some sort of a protection mechanism, which we are going to talk a little, um, later called DRM. And with DRM, it's um, it protects the music that you download on your device such that you cannot pretty much send it to another device and listen to it on that device. So if you have your um, iPhone or your Mac or any Apple device that you pretty much download Apple Music on and um, that Apple Music, that music that you downloaded will be somehow associated with your Apple ID. So if you send it to a different, uh, so if, if you send it to a friend with a different um, Apple ID, they will not be able to play that music because it is DRM protected. Same thing with Spotify. I mean, there are ways around it, but it is still considered unethical and the technical security controls and mechanisms in place to protect software piracy is pretty much DRM. Same thing with um, software piracy from, from a key, key and licensed viewpoint. You download a software and pretty much use another key to break it or try to try to kind of replicate the current software by maybe making your device offline such that it doesn't connect your application offline so that it doesn't connect to the internet to validate the key and then you give the key to another person so there's really nothing to validate. I mean there are a lot of ways to go around this, not that I advertise that, but the ability the, to go around those controls is what tends to result in a new model such that controls are really in place to ensure it doesn't happen. Like uh, when you take a look at, um, when you think of the software and applications we keep talking about, they are now adopting the pretty much subscription based where think of Office 365, you pretty much cannot actually use Office 365 on a different computer. If you have to do that, you then still need to use your account. I believe Office gives you like five devices that you can install. So if there is a sixth device, you actually are limited to those five. You can use that even with your account. So that's another way of pretty much getting rid of piracy issues as it relates to license keys and everything. Now, the subscription model is not only meant for piracy, but there is definitely a new business model relate, uh, related to it because they get more money from subscription and everything. But as it relates to information security, it definitely helped with piracy. Now, there are organizations that pretty much focus entirely on intellectual property um, in the U.S., we have the USPTO, they are out there in Alexandria, and they are pretty much in, responsible for giving um, IP licenses. And, and we have the SIIA, we have the BSA, and on a global scale, we have WIPO, that's the War Intellectual Property Organization. WIPO is... Uh, United Nations Agency, and they pretty much operate on a global scale. Next, we have another categories of thread, which is deviation in quality of service. Now, with deviation in quality of service, it poses a risk to organizations because it kind of limits their ability or their, or their need to it limits their resources or pretty much exhausts their resources and things like that. So they are not able to function as they are meant to. 
An example would be internet service issues from an internet service provider. Like when you think of an organization that pretty much needs a high internet bandwidth to function properly and the services tends to keep fluctuating or it keeps um, getting lost, that will definitely impact the organization's ability to function. When you also think of internet service from a website viewpoint, if um, an organization is not hosting their own website, so they are pretty much leveraging a hosting provider, it is pretty much the responsibility of the hosting provider to ensure uptime. And every time that web hosting provider goes down, it's going to impact the organization's capability. So think of Amazon once again. If Amazon are hosting their website, let's say with GoDaddy, by the way, they are not. But if say they are hosting their website with GoDaddy and GoDaddy got, uh, is attacked or something happens, that is, or maybe GoDaddy had some sort of an interruption that is going to impact Amazon's website because their website is going to go down, which means Amazon is going to lose a lot of money for every time the website is down. So that is something definitely for organizations to consider. And if you find yourself as an information security specialist within an organization, these are all things to definitely look into to ensure that there will be no issues. Now with organizations, there are with service providers, there are always some sort of a service level agreement, which will also go in um, in depth, especially with internet service providers. What organizations can do is pretty much have a backup plan, kind of, okay, if you are using Comcast for your internet, you should also have some sort of a service going on with maybe Verizon such that you can quickly switch. Um, there are a lot of ways. Uh, maybe insurance is also another um, another control. It's a control in a sense that insurance might decide to refund you all the money that you lost as a result of internet service issues. So there are definitely certain controls, but each control will have to be tailored according to the organization's need. And uh, when you think about it, there are organizations that also do need internet services, but they will not be impacted if something were to go down such as going back to the cupcake example I gave earlier, if the web hosting provider were to pretty much go down for 10 days, chances are it's not going to impact that lit, uh, that small cupcake business because their business do not doesn't depend on the internet service. And this is one of the reasons why it is really important as a security specialist or security analyst or expert or whatever, it's really important to understand what are the needs and priorities of the organizations and how does certain threats impact the organization? Because not all type of threats will impact an organization. Okay. Looking into um, the second one, which is communications and other service providers, pretty much along the same lines. Think of it as, um, Let's say you, let's say an organization or maybe one owns a bottled water company, uh, going slow a little bit here because I'm trying to come up with an example. But uh, let's say one owns a bottled water company and the organization goal is to pretty much serve the entire Arlington, Virginia area, and they need to produce at least 1,000 bottles of water per day to service that area. And for them to be able to produce 1,000 bottles, they will need at least 100 gallons of water per day. Now, if the water company, for some reason, decides, or maybe something happened, it could be intentional, it could be unintentional, it could be a lot of reasons. But if for some reason the water supply is 20 instead of the 100 they need per day, it means that company can only produce pretty much 20% of whatever they are meant to produce. That will be 200, 200 bottles. Definitely 200 is not going to, it's not going to uh, serve the, 
Arlington, Virginia area because it um, the area requires at least a thousand bottles. This is a huge risk to the organization because it's going to impact their credibility. It's going to open a room for competition to come into place because by not servicing the area, uh, the entire Arlington, Virginia area, it means they are creating additional market for others, for competitors to come into play. So these are all kind of things that definitely have an impact on organizations and they are all related to security because loss of the services will definitely affect the organization's ability to function. And if the organization's ability to function is impacted, then it means they will not be able to achieve their goals. Just similar to the ISP. I mean, think of it going back a little bit here to the ISP. If you are a movie theater and you pretty much, if you own a movie theater and that movie theater you tend to stream um you have to stream the movies that you're showing to pretty much your customers and your customers are paying tickets to <clears throat> to watch their movie in 4k which we all know that 4k requires a higher bandwidth anytime there is an internet issue it means that the bandwidth is less as well as the quality is not going to be 4k that could open a lot of issues because your customers has, have already paid to watch their movies on 4K. Unless you have some clauses in your agreement and um, it's clear, it could even open a room for lawsuits. Uh, they could request to have refunds for the movies that they paid because they paid for 4K and you weren't able to show them 4K or because your internet services were a little bit down at the time. Another issue is along the lines of power irregularities. This has to do with fluctuation of power, could be from a power shortage as well as power losses, um, could be higher voltage, could be lower voltage. Um, organizations have servers and servers definitely require a certain type of voltage to function as well as a certain amount of current to function. Any degradation in terms of uh, in terms of the amount of current and voltage that is flowing into the servers might result in the, in the servers not functioning properly. Or if there is some sort of a power surge and power excess, it could result in some circuits being blown out in the servers because it's not meant to handle that sub of um, excess power. So these are all things that can definitely affect organizations. With regards to power, there are also controls that can be put in place one could be for organizations to use stabilizers for um, stabilizers along the power lines for servers. They could also use surge protectors. And each single thing tends to have some sort of a way to deal with it and control in place. Third, we have espionage and trespass. And just like individuals have their own properties, you have a land and you put a no trespassing sign because you don't want anyone going into your land or your own property. You don't want anyone going into your house. So you put maybe no trespassing and things like that. Similar thing applies to technology as well as your information systems, software and all of that. Because systems, all they do is house information. And by housing information, there are definitely ways to access that information by going through the system. Now. Authorized access means someone who has, who can legitimately access that information. Maybe that person has an account with a username and a password. And there are definitely unauthorized individuals that are not allowed to access those that do not have accounts. However, similar to homes, people with keys means if you give someone a key, it means that, you, that person has an authorized access to pretty much go through your front door, unlock, um, use the key to unlock the door and then go into the house, uh, into your home. And there are definitely those without keys that will try to break the window or find some sort of a back door or vulnerability, or they can even decide to break a wall and just go in there. That's pretty much part of unauthorized access. Now, as it relates to um, technology, pretty much the general name for those people 
or for those individuals that try to access information with uh, without the proper access, the unauthorized individuals, we just refer to them as hackers. Um, hackers just pretty much bypass security controls to access information. And there are different types of hackers, especially these days where everyone tends to think the term hacker is cool or being a hacker is cool, but there are different types of hackers depending on the skill set. We have the expert hackers. Those are individuals that definitely know what they're doing. They write, um, they write programs, they write scripts, write exploits that will definitely be used to pretty much break um, break those controls that are in place that are meant to stop them. And still using the house and uh, home analogy, think of someone who has the capabilities by just looking at a lock or looking or playing around with a lock, they can just go and maybe make their own key. They sit down, kind of like cut their own key and then they use it to pretty much access an individual, uh, an individual's home that will be considered an, an expert hacker. And then we have those unskilled hackers, those that pretty much look into um, tools that have been created by expert hackers and leverage on that to implement their, uh, to break their own, con um, to break the security controls in place that are meant to stop them. An example of that will have to do more with um, people that usually download so you go on a website, you download um, key generator for Adobe, I guess, or maybe for Microsoft Office. All you have to do is just download that key generator and then generate a, a license key and just put it there. Maybe a, an expert hacker have already even detailed out the instruction that you should follow. Maybe go and block this firewall, do this, do that. And... Um, an unskilled hacker will just go ahead and follow the instruction of an expert hacker to implement. Relating this again to the home analogy, that will be someone like who just looks at the lock that you have in place. Now, I don't know the different brands of locks, but let's say there is a company A that makes a type of lock. So they just look at company A and know this is the type of lock and then um, Pretty much this is the type of lock in place and what they do is maybe go and make their own research on okay what how do i pretty much break this lock rather than sit down and break or maybe create the tools that will break the lock they might end up just going into um a store and just getting maybe a master key that unlocks pretty much all the types of lock that company a is uh, company A makes. So that would be more of an unskilled hacker. Then we have the crackers, same thing. They fall between either an expert or an unskilled. And these are pretty much those that cracks or remove software protection. So we mentioned earlier how Apple Music, if you download it on a computer, you cannot copy it to another place that um, doesn't have that same Apple ID, the ability to pretty much crack that control and make sure that it is not in place such that you can transfer the music to another person who doesn't have the same Apple ID and they were able to play it. The ability to do that will fall under cracking. Um, similar thing with passwords. Um, Adobe, Adobe Reader files, actually no, Adobe files, that's PDFs. If P PDFs can have controls as well as passwords in place and um, not really duplication, but you might not be able to print, you might not be able to copy and paste and things like that. If you are able to crack that or one is able to crack that, that is part of um, a cracker. Then we have the pre uh, freakers. Now, because early communication systems were more uh, telephone systems, there was a huge um, amount of freakers at the time because what they do is they just hack into telephone systems and they make free calls. And um, I don't know if you guys can remember, but with telephone lines back in the days, you can just pretty much cut a cut the telephone line and just tap into it. That's all part of what freakers do. 
Now, passwords are a common control mechanisms to stop access. I mean, lately, passwords are not even limited to just technologies. We have doors with password combinations. We, I mean, passwords did not really start with the technology era. They have always been in existence in terms of having things protected with a password, some sort of a combination. And the ability to attack those, I mean, there are always ways to attack the passwords and could be successful, could be unsuccessful, but there are different types of password attacks. There is the cracking, which is about cracking a password. There is the brute force, which has to do with trying different types of combinations, just randomly trying combinations until you're able to um, unlock it. There is the dictionary attacks, which has more to do with um, using just regular dictionary terminology. So for my colleagues out there, for those of you who tend to use dictionary terms to pretty much secure your devices, maybe you have, um, I don't know, you have a car and you really love it. So you just put your password as C-A-R. That is a dictionary term and a, uh, a dictionary word. So implementing a dictionary attack means um, one can get it, but that is not only dictionary at the limit of dictionary attacks. It's not limited to just the words and dictionary. A combination of passwords. So today you use this password, tomorrow you use this password, maybe after a year you use this password and all those passwords are being collected somewhere else, maybe in the database. That collection is part of like your database, uh, your password database, as well as your password dictionary and trying those passwords, maybe after a year you decide to use a password that you used three years ago. And if an attacker has access to that database, they will be able to pretty much try all your previous passwords and get it. Now we have rainbow tables. Rainbow tables are types of attacks that um, has to do with um, getting distracted here because my kid is crying. But rainbow tables are a types of attacks that has to do with um, passwords that have been hashed. So when we type of passwords, that is one we refer to as a one-way password mechanism, as a one-way hash, which is you type your password, but what is being stored is not really the password because it's, has, it has been hashed, which means it's been changed to something else. And that hash is usually what is related to the um, passwords. And that is what is being used to access. So there are instances where if someone have access to the hash, they might be able to regenerate your password as well as um, gain access to your systems or maybe get unauthorized access to whatever it is that they're trying to break. We also have the social engineering. This has more to do with talking to individuals as well as understanding a lot of information that relates to certain things and putting all those things together to pretty much come up with the password. An example would be maybe, um, let's say I use Oh, let's say I use my favorite movie's name as my password, which is which used to be Pulp Fiction, by the way. Did I just give you guys my favorite movie? Well, I never use it as a password, but let's say I use that as my favorite. Uh, let's say I use that as my password. Implementing social engineering will be an attacker to come close to me and another like, so, hey, how are you doing, you know? try to get to know me, but they have their own agenda. We start talking and then we get talking into about, uh, we get talking about movies and then we continue. Um, and then they kind of ask me like, so what's your favorite movie? And then I tell them Pulp Fiction and there is it. I give them my password. Uh, sometimes they might even do that to kind of gain a lot of knowledge about you so that they put things together to come up with the password. Um, think about it when um, we are setting our passwords most of the time we tend to choose maybe three secret questions like what's the name of your childhood friend, the name of the street you grew up in, uh, your favorite movie, and all of that. Another a mechanism could be they actually don't want the password, but rather they just need the answers to those security questions and they will be able to get it by just socializing with you. 
with an individual and once they have all of that they can go and reset the password so that is all part of social in, uh, engineering it involves dealing with um, interacting with humans to pretty much understand more about them and gain information so that the um, an attacker uses that information for their own gain all right um another form of uh, attack has to do with Again, uh, another form of attack related uh, to relates to unauthorized access has to do with uh, is shoulder surfing. Shoulder surfing has to do with um, individuals just looking at inf information that they are not authorized to see. So you, an example will be, let's say you have access to a highly classified data. I mean, going back to Coca-Cola again, let's say you have access to Coca-Cola's recipe and the coca-cola recipe has to do with maybe just a certain amount of coal um a certain amount of sugar and maybe random things let's put things out there i do not know what what the ingredients in coca-cola are but uh hypothetically speaking let's say they need cocoa and maybe um a certain amount of sugar but a tablespoon of cocoa and half spoon of um and a teaspoon of sugar is the combination that will make up coca-cola and you have access to that and you open it on your computer solar shopping will be uh show, shoulder surfing will be someone going behind you seeing over your shoulder what exactly you're doing or what that information is even though they are not authorized to see it another uh form of that has to do with like at atms Maybe you go in with your ATM card, there are people behind you and you try to punch in your password, but they're actually seeing what you're doing. This is a common thing, especially in public uh, places. Think of um, um, airport, think of in plane where you might decide to be walking, but then there is a little gap between the seats and someone behind sitting um behind you will be able to be seeing what you're doing from texting and all of that including your instagram likes <laughs> and then um yeah there are controls in place that to limit shoulder surfing because most of the time shoulder surfing doesn't happen directly at a 180 degree angle it tends to be somehow 45 or some i mean at the shoulder so there are protections i mean putting a screen protector that doesn't reflect uh, that covers entirely and doesn't allow someone to see your screen if they are not like directly in front of your computer it's one mechanism sometimes it's just making sure that there's no one behind you okay. now as it relates to um, passwords every time you keep hearing password you should have this combination you have this password land and whatsoever and what we're going to go over here what this table is showing us is when you look at alpha passwords alpha passwords are just those passwords that uses only the alphabets just a to z no special characters no numbers and when you set up a password that is only eight um, characters in length let's say what's eight maybe a b c d e a b c d e f g h yeah that's maybe that's your password um the odds of someone cracking the password meaning the chances of someone to be able to guess that password or to be able to break that password if the land is only eight is actually one in pretty much 200 and 8 billion i guess yeah 208 billion so yeah that is one is one in 208 billion however if that same person that same attacker has a computer that has this maybe specification a computer with i7 processor and all of these kind of like 4.4 gigahertz processing speed and all these kind of specification, it will only take them 1.01 seconds to be able to open a password, to be able to crack a password that is an alpha password with eight uh, character length, with eight characters. 
So you see how quick is it? There are a lot of tools out there that can be used to unlock, uh, to crack passwords. So an unskilled hacker can really go online and download a lot of tools like Brutus, Rainbow Crack, Ken and Abel is also a popular one. There is um, um, another popular one that was really good at the time uh, back in the days. So, oh, John the Reaper. John the Reaper is also another. So yeah, now if you just add just a single character, just a single alpha character, instead of eight, you decide to make your password nine characters, it's gonna take at least five trillion, uh, there is one in five trillion chances of the password being cracked. Now, this is all assuming that someone does not have this. Well, even if someone has this PC, there is one in at least five trillion chances of um, the password being cracked. But it's only going to take 26.2 seconds to break that. So when you think about it, and it's only going to take 26.2 with these, uh, with a computer with this specification. Now, if you have a computer with, that has more power, that is much more powerful than this, it means the time is going to go less, which means the time to crack it is going to be less. And if you have a computer with a lower uh, configuration and specification as this, it means the time it's going to take will be higher. So these are all ways to uh, pretty much estimate the timing. And if you have a computer that, um, sorry, if you make your password length 10, you will, it will take at least 14 trillion. Yeah, there will be one in 14 trillion chances and the time is going to be 11.4 minutes. Look at the difference between just nine and 10 as it relates to time. One is 26.2 and the other is 11.4 minutes. Okay. 